Hello and welcome to this special interview with Prashant Kishore. He is a master strategist who has helped Mamata Banerjee win West Bengal with a landslide. And not just that, he has advised a whole long list of chief ministers and other political personalities. So Prashant Kishore, welcome to this interview. Thank you. Now let me begin with a tweet that you have done recently. And I'll just read this out and I'm quoting directly from it. The idea and space that the Congress represents is vital to a strong opposition. But Congress leadership is not the divine right of an individual, especially when the party lost more than 90% of the elections in the last 10 years. Let the opposition leadership be declared democratically. So Prashant, let's analyze the statement that you made. Clearly, you're not attacking the Congress, but its leadership. What prompted you to make such a statement? Well, the idea is not to attack anyone. The whole debate in the last few days, days and weeks about uh, whether an effective opposition means opposition with Congress or without Congress. And my statement in my tweet, I'm very clear that the idea in this space that Congress, Congress represents or supposed to represent is vital for opposition and effective opposition in this country. But Congress party, the idea or the, uh, the space they represent is not same as the Congress in the present formation under the present leadership. And what I mean by this is that under the present leadership, Congress has not done very well. And I have put the data for the people to see themselves. In last 10 years, more than 50 elections state and, uh, uh, and general elections, uh, if you combine that together, Congress has lost almost 90% of those elections, except for uh, 2012 Karnataka, uh, 2017 in Punjab, and three elections which they won, which is Chhattisgarh, Madhya Pradesh, and Rajasthan in uh, December 2018. Out of these five elections, Congress has not won any major state or any general election since 2012. What does it tell us? It, it tells us even somebody who doesn't understand necessarily politics and this space should be able to understand that there is something fundamentally wrong the way Congress has organized itself in the present context, the way they approach uh, uh, elections, the way they engage uh, with people, uh, there is something wrong. And I'm saying that, I, and I'm not suggesting that leadership of, I'm nobody to suggest who should be the leader of Congress. I'm saying let it be decided uh, democratically rather than uh, someone just saying that XYZ would be the president and certainly not when Congress alone and again I'm referring to the formation the the party alone is not uh, the full opposition you have met other parties as well so let them decide together that who should lead it what is wrong in it now you had mentioned that the Congress did win recently. You mentioned some of the states that they won, Madhya Pradesh, Chhattisgarh. This is under the leadership of the Gandhi. So why would you say, given the fact that earlier, yes, they had ruled from 2004 to uh, 2014, there was a huge blowback to that, and they are recovering ground. Why would you attack the leadership? Because they, they can demonstrate, Rahul Gandhi can say, look, we won these three states in the midst of a Modi wave uh, that swept the country. Well, again, I repeat, my idea is not to attack anybody. But again, I take you to the Congress's performance over the last 10, 20 years, which is the time horizon uh, related to the present leadership. Uh, when you look at Congress, last time, a lot of people think that Congress's decline is a recent phenomenon. Actually not. Hmm. Congress, last time they have won this country was in 1984. After 1984, for your viewers, it's very important to understand. Mm -hmm. After 1984, Congress has not won a single general election in this country. Yes, they have ruled in the interim for 15 years, once as a minority government and twice as a coalition government. But as a party, they haven't necessarily won the country. I give you an example to make it clear. Like in 1989, for generally people think Congress lost in 1989. Number of MPs that Congress won was 198, if I recall correctly. In 2004, everyone thinks that Congress won, but actually Congress won 145 MPs. So as a political party, their decline is secular. Except in 2009, they went up to yes, 200 and above. But I tell you, even in 2009, even though the number of Lok Sabha seats that 
uh, they one went up marginally, but a better gauge of a political party, uh, to my mind, is look at the assembly constituencies where they were they are either winning uh, they are the winning party or they are number two. And uh, out of four thousand odd constituencies which we have in the country, I'm talking about the Bidhan Sabha. Congress at its peak used to be number one or number two in close to about 3,500 assembly constituencies. Today, that number is down below to 1,600. And that's a one-way decline. And especially after 1985, this graph has been one way. So what I'm saying is the decline in Congress is not a temporary phenomena, definitely not linked to an, an individual or a, an episode. It is far more deeper, it is a structural and any revival plan, if there is any attempt to revive, has to take care in these factors in, in, in account. Otherwise, you would be doing a job which would not get you the result. That's my, uh, my take. You can disagree with it, but the idea is to just put the fact on the table. Now, one of this the is not my analysis. This is the fact, the right. hard fact. The data are, is out there in the public domain. Anyone can check this. Now, one of the after you tweeted, one of the charges that people have made is that, look, you were in talks with the Congress to advise them on their strategy. Uh, since it never worked out, this is now a kind of a vengeful, a retribution that you have been, you know, now going on the attack because you can't work with the Congress anymore. Well, uh, this is like uh, people who doesn't understand necessarily how these talks happen and at, at this level. I don't find any problem in them having this belief, but See, I have worked with parties which have been directly fighting uh, Congress. So to that extent, Congress would have never got into uh, talks with me. A lot of people are saying he's gone for hire, he's a consultant. Okay, that's fine. But then your leadership was not very smart in talking to a small-time consultant. They should have been talking to somebody, the great uh, politicians who are part of the party. Why they were talking to me? I did not invite myself. Nobody, in fact, can invite themselves to the House of Gandhi's or the leadership of Congress and say, okay, please come and hear my strategy. I did not do that. I was genuinely, with all, in all my honesty, I, they asked, we engaged, and I, I shared what I thought is the right approach. They are within their right to accept or reject. There is no problem with that. But I am within my right to do what I think is right. So... There is no problem if Congress accepts what I put on the table or they reject. This is for them to decide. Who am I to decide? But please grant this to me that I am equally at liberty to do what I feel like doing. You cannot say that I will reject your proposal and I would also ask you not to do anything. That is not within the hands of Congress or for that matter anyone. They are free to do what they are thinking. They thought what I'm suggesting is not right or not doable, whatever may be the reason. I don't want to get into, I'm not somebody who brings the private conversation in public domain, never. But, and I'm seeing the selective leak, which Congress, from Congress side that happens in media, I don't care much. I have been in talks with Congress leadership since last two years. Most of these leaders or those who are feeding media, they are not even aware. But, those things are not important. What is important is, yes, the fact is I was in conversation with Congress after post-Bengal election in a much more structured, intense or engaged, uh, uh, engaging manner. But, uh, and we suggested few things. They were, uh, by and large, there was consensus. I must tell you, I almost joined Congress. I almost joined Congress. So there was not that much disagreement. But for few issues on which we realize that they are coming together uh, rather than it, uh, it is of being, of being of help, it could be counterproductive for both sides. And we amicably decided, okay, no problem. You do uh, your job and I am free to do my job. So there is no acrimony at all. Now, one of the things is you had talked about how the Congress needs to... The acrimony is in the heads of the uh, journalists who are trying to take position every day one way or other. <laughs> They well, no that's their, their job to do. Yeah, they are, they are doing their job. <laughs> yes. now, but if you look at it, you talked earlier about the fact that the Congress needs, for 20 years, there's been a, a, a not more than just a secular decline. The Starting from years. I'm so saying 1985 was 1985, their peak in the present form. Correct, correct. Because the Congress, the way it exists, is a Congress that started in 1967. Right. So if you analyze after that, 
since uh, they peaked in at 1985 and when I gauge their uh, peak, I'm looking at assembly constituencies together with the parliamentary seats, not only the parliamentary constituencies, because if you focus only on parliamentary constituency, you might see the bump up in 2009. But if you club this together, you will see the decline is secular. Now, therefore, if you come to it, what needs to be done for the Congress? Since this, you say, is a space that needs to be uh, gotten, what needs uh, the current Congress, supposing they don't rely with anybody, what do you think needs to be done? Well, this is not something which can be articulated here in a short interview, but uh, definitely they need to change uh, the structure, the way they, ha they are structured as a party, the way they function, the way they uh, take decisions. Uh, mm, you know, I give you one example. Uh, Congress president position. Forget about the complicated issues. A political party of a size and a scale uh, and the legacy uh, like the one we have, uh, the Congress, is uh, they functioning with an interim or a president or a stopgap arrangement for three years, is this a very smart move? Do you need a Prashant Kishore or for that matter anyone to come and advise? You know it that it's not the best move. If whoever you choose, you should have a full-time president. Now I, I know that of late there has been some voices saying that the present president is a full-term president. But then make it. Why are you calling it an interim arrangement? then say that it's a full-term president. So I, I can go on listing like... What else would you say that the Congress need in, in the sense you've seen the leadership all across. What, they, what do they need to do now? See, I don't want to be prescriptive. I'm nobody to suggest uh, publicly what uh, Congress should be doing. But I can only say what is already in the public domain. They need to uh, uh, sort out their leadership issue. They need to have uh, faster decision-making. They need to uh, empower the local leaders. They cannot centralize the entire decision making and keep in the hands of few individuals in Delhi. India is too big and too vast to, uh, to have all the knowledge and expertise centralized in the hands of few individuals in Delhi. Uh, and uh, if you look at the glory days of Congress, those days Congress was not necessarily run um, by quote unquote this set of general secretaries or secretaries who sit in Delhi. They were strong because they had a very strong regional leaders. I'm not saying they are not, uh, they are not having regional uh, strong le leaders now. And the, the system, the way Congress works, to the best of my understanding, whatever little I have observed, uh, that the power, the real power is centralized in the hands of general secretaries and what people call party high command. That at times uh, uh, is the biggest uh, uh, stumbling block in any real revival of Congress on the, at the grassroots. Now, if you come uh, uh, to what uh, Mamata Banerjee, Banerjee said recently, that the UP is dead, and there was almost a direct attack on uh, the fact that someone was going abroad, they, you know, in politics you need to be engaged continuously, you can't go off abroad. Is the UPA dead? Is she right in saying so? Well, what she said, she, only she can explain, but it's logical uh, that UPA is not a formid UPA was brought in existence post-2004 to form a government, to run the government. It was not an arrangement to uh, have a political coalition in a situation when you are not in government. And even if assumed that it was for both, it has been almost 15, 16 years so probably it's time to relook at its formations, its functioning, its uh, com uh, because components have changed. Many who were part of UPA have gone out. Many who are no who were not part of uh, UPA have come in. Dynamics have changed. So you cannot have a, a UPA as it was in 2004 and keep on saying that the same uh, formation exists with the same components, same. Uh, uh, mechanics, working mechanics. So you're saying it's outlived its usefulness? I'm not saying, I'm saying it need to be uh, re-looked at, at least the way it is, uh, if there is a need for an UPA, that need to be re-looked at. And the you talked the of, formation of it. Sure. I'm, I'm coming back to that. You talked of the divine right. No individual has a divine right to live. Clearly you were talking of a certain dynastic predilection that the Congress is... Uh, is no, is, uh, it, 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 this is something which like widely is speculated. I, it's not directed towards an individual. 
my point is simple that as a political as a leader of the political party if you take the credit when the party wins world over democracies when you lose you step aside and you let somebody else come and fight have we seen a us president uh, potential us president uh, uh, losing the election and then continuing to be the challenger for all elections to come you can have one chance you can have two chances you can have three chances but how many chances you need and if for some reason it is not working whether it is for right reasons or not that's a different debate but for some reason if it is not happening it's time you let somebody else take a charge i don't know who the somebody else is i frankly don't know it but if under your leadership your form and why only political parties take any corporate take any entity take a captain of the indian cricket team or any team for that matter if team is constantly failing to win not once not twice not one month one not one year over 10 years 90% time you are failing isn't it logical to think that please step away and let somebody else do the job but uh, and yeah. that somebody could be from congress there's no problem in it but rahul gandhi did step away from the post and but he I'm hasn't not, taken over I'm, the i'm not talking about rahul gandhi i am talking about the leadership under which those last 10 years elections are being fought that leadership has failed in 90% of the elections that's the hard fact now whoever was the leader the morality or uh, strategic uh, sense tells you that should step away and let somebody else take the call now when you said divine right there is this issue of dynastic leadership the bjp is arguing well, well, what is your stand on dynastic leadership are you referring to congress in particular no. about this uh, see dynasty is a reality in this country to many of us it might look unfortunate but that's the fact if you look at again hard fact the data of those who get elected bulk of them if you look at the uh, under 40 mps uh, who are part of the present parliament or wo- were part of the last previous parliament more than 2/3 of them came from some dynasty uh, some sort of dynastic connection now that is telling you that when it comes to electoral politics the entry for those who does not have a dynastic background who does not have a dynasty to back it's becoming increasingly difficult and but that's a long term challenge which indian democracy has to confront uh, it's not an ideal situation but we cannot wish it away in a day either because it's not limited only to congress though it is largely attributed to congress other parties are also equally if not more at fault but some things these are things that evolve then they self correct and that's i i people like us would believe that in due course it will there will be some uh, effort to correct this thing where more and more younger people who get elected are coming from some kind of family which had a connection with with political ecosystem now you are advising mamata banji No I'm not advising Mamata Okay Bhattar. what is this the role is you play I I am not playing any role see the uh, another problem uh, with uh, media I'm s- sorry to say this whatever you say on record is completely discounted and discarded what you have not said is something <laughs> what media is is constantly So what is your role with the So I I said after post uh, Bengal election that I am quitting what I was doing and i'm actually not doing if you go and check with ipac the organization i used to work with i have gone and met uh, visited any one of the ipac offices maybe two or three times in last seven, six seven months my desire is to see if a political formation could be put together that is effective that uh, uh, strengthen this space of you know uh, the 60% which is not with the ruling dispensation and towards that i meet people but largely i am sitting at home doing nothing <laughs> okay we'll come to that but take a look at mamata banerji there is her uh, nephew abhijit banerji coming in abhishek abhishek Banerjee. sorry abhishek yes. banerji what is your view about that there is again a dynastic succession with the bjp's of uh, the no i i have already said this that dynastic the the whole uh, issue of dynastic polis- uh, politics is not and could not be attributed only to congress it is there in every party but since congress has been the ruling party for long in this country they take the bulk of the 
blame game. Actually, data and number again suggest that why the bulk of the blame lies with them because they are probably their share of those who represent dynasty is much more compared to other parties. Uh, but this is not to say that other parties are not having dynastic leaders. No. So what is your view about Abhishek Banerjee? Because uh, Abhishek, you know, Abhishek Banerjee, when I, when I have been working with TMC, the control and command of TMC is 100% with Mamta Banerjee. She's a hands-on leader. I don't think anybody, uh, and this question was asked uh, before the elections as well, that whether it is Abhishek Banerjee and Prashant Kishore who are running the show, actually that's not the case. It was Mamta Banerjee who was running the show and I, to the best of my understanding, she continues to run the show of uh, TMC. Abhishek Banerjee is one of the most important leaders of the party and that's how I look at it. What does he bring to the table? What does he brings to the table? It is for the party to decide, but definitely he's a three-time MP and uh, uh, I believe he's also now the general secretary of the party. So he is supposed to bring uh, the, his publicly stated uh, uh, position is to help party expand beyond Bengal. Now, Mamata Energy has been expanding or spreading her wings. We've seen what's happened in Goa, Meghalaya, Assam, Tripura. What is the, is she trying to become, is the TMC going to be the new INC, the Indian National Congress? Well, that is only, only time can tell. But this so-called quote-unquote expansion is also being overhyped. If you look at hard fact, it amounts to five, four or five Lok Sabha seats. So Tripura, uh, Congress is 0.1% vote share. So if Trinamul is going and fighting in Tripura, I don't know what is this whole uh, hue and cry about. At least they have got 20% vote in the local body elections. This is not to say that they have won Tripura. This is not to say that they have arrived at India level. The second case in point you are saying is Goa. Uh, Goa accounts for two Lok Sabha seats. If Trinamul is trying, and this is not the first time Trinamul is trying. Goa, Trinamul has fought before. And if they are trying to fight the election this time in a, a bit more organized manner, why it should be such a big, big hue and cry, I just don't understand. Those who talk about this united opposition, uh, I, it just, beyond my understanding, when Congress was fighting West Bengal, and they are now reduced to less than 5% vote share in, in West Bengal, are we to say that Congress should close to be a party in West Bengal? Otherwise, they, they are helping BJP? Today, Congress is fighting UP. They have all the right to fight. They have got less than 5% votes here, they are 7% if I recall correctly. Are we to say that Congress should shut uh, the, their unit in UP or they are agents of BJP? If Congress was fighting Andhra Pradesh, were they helping BJP? So you cannot have this definition of united opposition that suits you. If Congress if the, suppose there is a consensus that anyone who has got less than 5%, a lot of people say that, but in vast majority of seats, it's Congress who is directly fighting with BJP. But that's like trying to drive forward looking at the rear view mirror, mirror. If you apply the rule that anyone who gets less than 5% or 2% vote should give away, give in the favor of the larger party. Suppose you apply, you know, which, the party which will lose maximum is Congress. Because that, by that definition, Congress would not be able to fight a single seat in Bihar, single seat in Bengal, single seat in UP, Tamil Nadu, Andhra, all the large states, Congress will have to close their units. Are we willing to do that? Are they willing to do that? And if they are not doing it, if they have right to continue with their units and still try to strengthen their party, which is the right thing to do, what moral or strategic right they have to tell others not to do this. You cannot have both way. If you are saying that TMC should not go to any place where they have got less than 5% vote, okay, then close West Bengal. Congress should close West Bengal. Are they willing to close? Congress should close Andhra. Congress should close UP. Congress should clo close Bihar. So, so what is... But yeah. In the name of united opposition, you cannot have Congress opposition. Right. The Congress under present leadership. I again say, hmm. you cannot, 
that is when, when we talk about the new formation of UPA, this is what we are talking about. Congress is the stakeholder in most states. And they also are the, quote unquote, they have the leadership of UPA. You need to have somebody who is, quote unquote, seen a neutral arbitrator to decide who should fight how many seats in which state. If you really are interested in united opposition. But you will retain your right to fight Delhi. You will retain your right to fight Bengal. You will retain your right to fight UP. You will retain your right to fight Odisha or uh, Bihar or Tamil Nadu or Andhra. But you want nobody else to come in the territory where, quote unquote, you are winning or you have been a political force, but constantly declining and losing. No. Look at the strike rate of those who are... No, let me just complete yeah. this point because there's so much being talked about. Congress being the only force, the present Congress being the only force that, that is taking BJP. You know what is the strike rate of Congress against BJP in the last Lok Sabha? 4%. For every 100 seat that Congress fought vis-a-vis -vis straight with BJP, they won only 4 seats. The Lok Sabha number what they have, the bulk of the number comes from their, their victory in Tamil Nadu, in Kerala and Punjab where they were not facing BJP. So this argument has got no legs that this Congress is able to fight BJP because yes, they are fighting BJP, but they are not winning anything. They are, their win record vis-a-vis -vis BJP in the seat where they are taking BJP head-on is 4% in last Lok Sabha. And it was 6% in 2014 Lok Sabha. Now you have got two chance. And if out of those 200, 300 seats, somebody is saying, okay, allow somebody else to try in 10 seats or 15 seats or 20 seats. What is irrational about it? What is so wrong in it? Well, the fact that uh, she's poaching largely the Congress people who are coming from there. Now, see this again, poaching thing. Do you think people at this level, you have been a senior journalist, uh, ex-chief minister, ex-MPs, they can be poached if they don't want? People leave, if suppose Mamta Banerjee wants today to poach people from uh, BJP, is she, will she be able to do it? If Congress wants to poach people from, uh, say, TMC in uh, uh, West Bengal, can they do that? Look at West Bengal. BJP was able to poach a lot of people from TMC pre-election. Post-election, the it, it, what is happening is the reverse. Why? Because largely this sifting of people is a reflection of where people are seeing more or better opportunity. It's not a function of you or me or Mamta Energy or Rahul Gandhi or for that matter any individual trying to bring people. People will come only if they see some hope if they see better political future there for themselves. So you cannot poach anybody if you do not offer a better political proposition because these are hard not politicians, seasoned politicians. They are not coming to you just because uh, somebody has asked them to move. So what is Mamta Banerjee's game plan? No, what is, what is Mamta Banerjee's game plan? Only Mamta Banerjee can but explain. What do you see is... But yeah. I do see it is... Quite possible that a party like Trinamool or NCP or uh, uh, YSRCP, those who uh, whose roots could be found back in Congress idea, the space, the ideology, if some of them they put their act together, either on their own or coming together, they could very well emerge as a possible alternative. Now, Poss possible alternative to the present Congress formation, and this is a not this is not a new phenomenon. If it has happened in, in Congress, it has happened at least three or four times in their long history. It has happened last time when Indraji did it. She came out and she made the Congress and that Congress became the biggest Congress. When she broke from the Congress of that time, bulk of the established leaders of Congress were with, remained with the quote-unquote original Congress. So this Congress, what we have is a Congress I. Theoretically speaking, because Indraji is Indraji, I'm not trying to compare her with anybody, but what I'm trying to say is that theoretically that possibility exists. Anybody can create a new Congress. The, again, I can't repeat this enough, the space. And in that space, if someone becomes bigger than the present Congress, obviously you will see some sifting. Now, but come to the point of this. The, the fact is, 
that uh, maybe, I mean, from what we read of uh, what Mamata Banerjee said, she would like opposition unity, that wherever the strengths of the regional parties are there, she would rather retain those strengths. So in some senses, the, uh, whether it is Stalin in Tamil Nadu, whether it is Jagan Reddy in Andhra, whether it is KCR, uh, Chandrasekhar Rao in uh, Telangana, whoever's strong in that particular region, let them fight as it is, and then let us unite as an opposition, whether it's Pawar in Maharashtra. The fact is, the argument seems to be heading is that let the sum of the parts make the whole. So, therefore, they can become a formidable opposition to this. Will that work no. against the BJP? No, it will not. What will work? It will not work. I have, been, I have been on record on saying this again. This whole notion that everyone coming together uh, will create a very formidable opposition to uh, defeat BJP, the first part is correct. If everyone comes together, it will look or it would appear to be far more formidable opposition than what uh, it would look if they are not united, quote-unquote. Uh, but that's not necessarily the recipe for winning uh, the election with the BJP. We have seen it in many states. In Assam, there was a Mahagadbandan that has been defeated. We have seen it in UP where BSP, SP and other parties came together. They were defeated. So one has to look at what has happened and learn from it. Merely coming of many parties, merely coming together of many parties is not a sure sort recipe of success against the present BJP. Yes, it could make you appear a bit more formidable or maybe formidable uh, opposition, but it's not the recipe for the new, uh, uh, for the victory against BJP. For that, you need the face, you need the narrative, and then comes the arithmetic which people see in form of uniting a united opposition. So you say that you need a leader with a narrative and the machinery that goes. Yes, on. because people are not merely going to vote for any formation. This is my limited understanding purely because 10 people from different part of, uh, parts of India having their respective strength in their, uh, their regions uh, come together. So if Mr. Stalin, suppose, is a very popular leader in, in, in DMK, uh, in, in Tamil Nadu, he comes and stands in uh, uh, joint hands with Didi in uh, Bengal. Optically, it might look that they are all together, but in real terms, in real voting preferences terms, I don't think people of Bengal are going to vote for that combination just because Mr. Stalin is standing with Didi and the vice versa. If Didi goes and stands with uh, uh, Stalin, uh, in uh, Tamil Nadu, that doesn't mean that uh, m he will get more vote just because Didi is standing there. Yes, them, there, some in some areas, opposition parties coming together could add to a winning combination. But in many areas, it could be counterproductive. Look at what has happened in Assam. You came together and it just allowed BJP to uh, have register a bigger victory. Now, after, the, and, and this is not what I am saying, after the election, now the, the alliance has already fallen out. So this ad hoc approach that wherever it suits you, you call for united opposition. And in the name of united opposition, actually what you're doing is you're trying to uh, get rid of any possible competition which is coming your way. And you're making a lot of hue and cry. Oh, it's, a, it, 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 it's going to help BJP. But those who are making the noise, they are not realizing that if this rule is applied, say there is a meeting of all opposition leaders, and I have said this before, I am repeating it. And everyone comes to an agreement that let's have an objective criteria which would be applicable to all participating parties to decide whether or not they should go and contest election in an estate. And if that benchmark is set, the biggest loser would be the present Congress because they have many states where they have uh, uh, organizational units, they continue to fight elections, and they have got vote share less than 5% or less than 10%. But no one is asking them to shut the units there. So if Trinamool tomorrow gets 5% vote in Goa, or 10% vote in Tripura or Meghalaya, why are you getting so nervous? You know, coming to the point you said you need a leader. Yes. Who is that leader that you see in the horizon that can take on the formidable challenge that BJP poses? I, I really don't know. I don't have this wisdom. And I say What this, about Mamata Bayan? No, I'm telling I'm coming yeah. to it. I say this to many people in private conversation also, that this is an unnecessary exercise hmm. to trying to find out who is the leader. 
assume that we are sitting and having this interview in 1973-74. With all our wisdom, could any one of us be able to forecast that there will be a leader called JP who would unite and uh, who would present, who will become the face of opposition? If we were having this conversation, say, in 1985-1986, do you think we would have been able to foresee that there will be BP Singh who will become the face? If we were having this conversation, say, in 2010-11, do you think we would have been able to say that Mr. Modi would be the face? So this whole debate that let's first identify the face, till the face is fined, you cannot have a challenger, that's a misunderstanding. The space which is opposite, the fight is between, the BJP represents 40% and the 60%. The, you need a unifier face narrative and the operational structure to convert that support into the vote. But it is not to say that narrative has to wait till a face comes. Look at the two biggest, three biggest uh, uh, U-turns or the, the episodes on which Modi government has taken back step. One first was the land acquisition bill. The protest was not led by, can we recall any face that led that protest? No. The second was CANRC on which they haven't moved forward at least, if not, they, they have not repealed it, but they have not moved ahead. Can we recall any leader who can t be credited that because of XYZ leadership, government was forced to take the step back? And as recently as few days back when the, they have gone back on the farm law, do we know any individual, one individual who can be credited? So what I'm saying is, if you have the right issues, you have you build the narrative face will emerge. But if you keep waiting and saying that no, till we find a face there, we can't do anything. That's not the right way to go about it. Now, it's good that you mentioned about the CAA protests, the farmers repeal. That's the. If you see these movements, they're somewhat spontaneous in their yes. emergence and doing. Yes. Is there also a message to the political class? that this sections, a lot of sections are fed up with them. They'd rather take issues onto the streets and do it themselves. Is that a larger message you're getting that the opposition in some senses have failed them? They do, do it themselves. Uh, well, it's part of democracy. I wouldn't say necessarily as uh, people seeing it as a failure of opposition. I would see that there are issues on which people take the matters in their own hand rather than uh, trusting or letting a, their interface, democratic interface, which the political parties are, to do the job. Uh, but more important than that, you have to see in the three things. One common thing is people-led. Another is the consistency with which the fight was done. It was not one in one day. It was not one in one month. Look at farm protest. It's going on for one year. So you have to have that will and stamina and uh, determination to stay put till it happens. You cannot just as imagine that I'm doing a, a tweet followed by uh, then a press conference followed by a few candle marches here and there and government should be on its knees. It's not going to happen. Look at these three protests, what has happened. People have fought for months. Now, if as an opposition party or an opposition leader, you are not able to do that, the recipe is right there. You don't need any Raj and Gappa or Prashant Kishore to come and tell what works. What works is you take up a public issue and show the will to stay with it. Hmm. Not by tweeting only, not by doing press conference in Lutians, Delhi, by being on the street, by being on the street, for months or months and months together till results shows up. That is where the problem is. Have you seen any opposition-led protest that has lasted more than three days? So that is the difference. And this is not a newfound wisdom. You go back and look at Gandhi's protest, Mahatma Gandhi's protest. One of the unique features about his protests were it was never for one day or two days. It will go on for 20 days, one month, five months, six months, one year. It's such a vast country. You cannot create impact by simply a, being agitated or appear to be agitated or concerned for one day. 
Even right. in case of look at the political history of likes of Mamta Banerjee, she sat on Dharna 21 days. When Congress leadership did it in UP, they they stayed put in case of Hathras or uh, even in the recent case of Lakhimpur, we saw some result. But you did tweet on Lakhimpur that yes. you said that this is, uh, you know, just making this doesn't make a party. Because, because you know, th we have this tendency, we have, as a nation, I think... We there are no moved, quick fixes, to quote you. Yeah, no yeah. quick fixes, because as a nation, we have moved in this 2020 mode. <laughs> Everything needs to be settled in one day. Everything has to be yes or no. Every, there is no space for any nuanced argument. Either you are uh, Bhakta of Modi or you are Bhakta of Rahul Gandhi. <laughs> there cannot be a space of any, any between. You, you, if you are uh, out there to defeat BJP, you have to be Bhakta of Modi, uh, Rahul Gandhi. If you are uh, uh, against Congress, then you have to be Bhakta of Modi. This, this is what is weakening the opposition. You have to be ready for nuanced understanding nuanced arguments and the formations that could be multi-layered rather than just saying the ki main hu ji aur meri naam pe ab taiyar ho jayi aur hum hi karenge bas jab tak hoga aaj ho 10 saal ke baad ho main hi karunga this whole whatsapp university culture as we say ki bhai sab kuch bas do hi line mein likha hua hai koi koi us pe samay nahi lagana chahta hai koi dekhna nahi chahta hai koi usko padhna nahi chahta hai aap bata dijiye bhai aap modi ke khilaf hain ki unke paksh mein hain if you are Modi, you have to be with Rahul Gandhi. If you are Rahul Ji, you have to be against Modi. This binary is what is hurting opposition or for that matter anywhere we are, where you are looking at credible solution. Some of these challenges are big and complex. They cannot, their answers could not be found into binaries. If okay, Rahul Gandhi is not going to be energy. If Mamta is not going to be energy, then you Aisa nahi hai. Maybe all three of them are needed, but in a formation that is different than what it is today. That is the point. Now, since you were mentioning Rahul Gandhi and earlier you said about leadership and the fact that the Congress has not uh, won in, under his, his leadership as well. Then his, no, uh, I have not said under his leadership. But under, his, the present under, leadership. under the Gandhi family, let's put it that way. Now, if, 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 if Rahul Gandhi, would you call him a defeated general that has to move out? Well... Uh, so again, let me put things in, in, in perspective. I have looked at data last 40 years. Uh, and then I have looked at the Congress win record under Sonia Gandhi ji, because she has been the longest serving Congress president like 20, 25 right. years. Her strike rate, electoral strike rate works out to be somewhere around 31-32%. So under Sonia Gandhi's leadership, Congress has won one third of the all the elections that they fought. When Rahul Gandhi was the president, his strike rate was same, slightly better, around 34-35%. But there, the problem is when there is, no, now since 2019, their strike rate has gone down to 10%, less than 10 or 11%, I believe. When no one knows who is the leader, when you don't know who is the leader, that is the problem. That 30% is not a great track record, but it is okay. It was okay. Congress, as I have been telling, even though they have been declining, they have remained a political force. And this is not one day thing. I am talking about 25 years. Anyone, anyone who has got interest in these things can go and look at the number of elections that Congress has fought under Sonia Gandhi as a Congress president. Her strike rate is one third. And the strike rate for Rahul Gandhi is also the same. So I'm not trying to single out one individual. I am saying as a party, you are, you are on a decline for last 35, 40 years. The leadership that has been there, they might have been able to form government a couple of times, but they haven't won India. And their strike rate, electoral strike rate has been about 30-35%. Since 2009, it has gone down to 10-11%. So you need to look at it. And who would you say, I mean, you had Rahul Gandhi and, have, you know, you haven't stopped, uh, talked of him in terms of a defeated general, but clearly your implication is that. No, uh, I'm saying uh, we cannot single out and call him a defeated general because for all practical purpose, you know, the leadership is combined. It's run by the Congress president and him. And it, they have changed the roles, but largely it is they who run Congress, has been running Congress 30 years. And while they 
have been credited and they should have been credited for what uh, uh, their ability to form UPA 1, UPA 2, they must take their share of blame for not necessarily able to revive Congress the way it should have been done. And this is like a commentary from a general citizen of this country. I'm not trying to be prescriptive to them that what they should have done. I'm just stating the fact. What about Priyanka Gandhi? What is your view about her? Do you think she has, you know, um, got the capabilities to lead the Congress? See, I again, I say I'm nobody to uh, assess and comment about anyone's capability. I'm stating the fact. But will she make a difference? I have no idea because she's not running the Congress. Whether when she will start running the Congress, we will have to look at the fact. And but what you see of her when she campaigns and everything else? It's very difficult because what I see of you as a journalist and what I see. Uh, of you when you are the managing editor could be very different. So Mr. Modi when he was not say the face of BJP if anyone would have tried to gaze what is his ability to influence electorates do you think we would have been able to call it right? We say we when he is the face he is the prime minister he is uh, the prime minister he, he was the prime minister candidate in 2014 that changes things dramatically. So and it is not only uh, limited to uh, politics. So a, a player, when he becomes captain, how good a captain he would make, you can make a guess, but you would actually get to know only when he becomes a captain. So since he is not... Or she is not in this case. She is not. We shouldn't try to kind of second guess what she could be a great Congress president, a reviving Congress, or she could uh, fail miserably. But what is your general impression of her when you see her campaigning? And well, My general impression is same as uh, what most people think. And it is in public domain. I'm nobody to pass a judgment on it. They are too big for me to comment about their abilities and what they are capable of. All I can say is that I'm... My comment is directed towards not an individual. It's that institution called Congress leadership. And I'm putting data out in public domain to say this has been your track record it's time you improve uh, or there is no point talking about and raising fingers at others so you're essentially saying the gandhi family should go no i'm not saying that because uh, what i said I mean, you is have to... you need to change the formation hmm. uh, you can be there but sometime the realignment or the uh, rearrangement of the formation could make you far better uh, because this present formation is certainly not working and this is not my assessment this is the fact so I'm all I'm saying is whether you listen to me or somebody else or your own inner wisdom uh, you need to change the present formation because this is not giving you the result and this is not going to give you result that much I can tell you the present formation the way they are and I'm not only making point towards Congress I'm saying talking about larger quote unquote UPA the present formation, the way in which in it is organized, they are very unlikely to be dramatically successful in next few years electorally against BJP. So take, let's take the Congress for the moment, keep the, aside the leadership. The fact is the Congress party is, if you take a look at the number of Lok Sabha uh, uh, segments that they have, they're probably in direct competition with BJP in 102 seats or more. The fact that they are a major sort of force in terms of the opposition, how would you incorporate the Are you going to fight? Would you advise any combination to ignore the Congress when other, then you, you no, know, you'll split see, the opposition I, votes? I, I, I am one of those who believe that Congress has got huge intrinsic strength on the ground. The, the idea and the space that Congress was supposed to represent and occupy remains a formidable on the ground. It's a question of how do you bring together and convert that in electoral success. So I'm a firm believer that there is no scope for any third party to go on to challenge the BJP in a real term uh, uh, at India level unless you take that space what you're talking about represented today by Congress led by the present leadership. But in the same voice, I'm also saying that you need to have a different formation. What is that space you talk about? What is the Congress space that... Uh... The Congress space, I would say, is roughly about 40-45%. Like, I'm, 
if I look at the uh, whole uh, in electorates in India, 40% of them, BJP could realistically look 40% of them as their denominator. They, they are getting anything between 30 to 35%, 37% vote. But one could safely assume that 40% of electorates in this country could be the could be seen as denominator for BJP. That doesn't mean that they will get 40% vote. Now, if you look at the electoral uh, data uh, of India, 20%, 10 to 20, 10 to 30% vote goes to the smaller. Uh, the challenger gets the bulk of the remaining 60. Right. Now that space has shrunk to about 25-30% for Congress in many cases. I'm not talking about the votes here, I'm talking about the denominator in which they right. operate. Because usually it should be another 40%. And so that um, the remaining 20% is distributed among very many players. Right. So if you want to become a challenger to the BJP, you have to create an equivalent 40% of the remaining 60% which is not voting for BJP. And there, Congress is getting about 50%. Their vote share is about 18-19%. Right. So that means in the remaining 40-odd percent, they are getting 50% vote. That is what I'm saying with the change in formation and strategy and a better effort. This could be taken up easily to 25-30%. It is quite doable. What does the Congress represent? I mean, one is, of course, electorally, but as... As, as, a, as a party, as an ideology, what does the Congress represent in your mind? See, uh, to this 60% at least, and I'm just making it simple, it could be 65, it could be 70, right. uh, Congress is still represents the default party which is suited to rule this country. They are the default party that has contributed to India what we have today. They are the default party to uh, seen as the protectors of the constitution or the values which probably our founding fathers would have seen uh, uh, for this country. So those are all huge advantages to have and they must need to build on it. But 19% vote share for an upcoming party is a huge plus. But 19% vote for a Congress is huge negative because you are coming down from 40 percent so your trajectory is going down and if some other party gets 10 12 15 percent vote their trajectory is going up and that makes a huge difference what, what is the values they represent when you know as compared to the bjp or any other parties what is it that the congress represents to the people i mean one is the electoral percentage but what do they well in a very broad term i think they are still seen as the primary occupant of left of center ideology the BJP appears to the electorate, the right of center. So this left of, whatever left of center ideology constitutes in minds of voters, you can largely attribute this to uh, Congress. And that's the space I'm talking about, which is a very large space in a country where 60-70% people do not make 100 rupees a day. That's the space, a Congress that is supposed to be the key voice and key player in that space. That's why you cannot uh, write off or you cannot um, ever wish Congress to be dead. But Congress as a party and Congress as a party being managed or the formation which exists are two different things. I'm talking about two different things. I'm talking about the Congress's space and the idea which is not same as Congress uh, uh, led by XYZ with XYZ as their faces. Now, coming, you also talked of the BJP earlier in a in a private conversation, which leaked to the media that the BJP is a formidable force. It's not going away in a hurry. Uh, you know, why do you say that? Yeah, this again, this leaking business is a new way of raising the TRP. Then nothing to be, nothing got leaked. It was a conversation I was having in Goa, uh, Museum of Goa, where people were asking ninety-minute conversation. Someone probably recorded part of it and put it in media. The, con the, I, the question was that why we are not able to defeat BJP mm -hmm. and when BJP will be defeated. My right. answer to that was that you cannot wish away BJP as a political force because first of all you have to see what has brought them here.
Mm -hmm. It's a long work, body of work, by generations of people over the last 50, 60 years that has started with Jansang maybe even before. Now you cannot, wish, and now after 60, 70 years of fight, whether you agree or you don't agree, that's a diff your call. But they have arrived with 30-35% vote. It is quite possible that they will lose elections, one or many. I repeat, it is quite possible that they lose election. But that does not mean that BJP as a political force is or could be wished away. Once you have this big an organization which gets 30% plus vote at India level, that political organization cannot be wished away. And that is the point I made. I'm, I did not say that next 30-40 years BJP is going to rule. You said center of Indian politics. I am saying yes, they are going to be the center of Indian politics for at least next 30-40 years, whether they win election or they lose election. As it was in the case of Congress, Congress lost many elections post-1967, but the politics of India was largely in and around Congress. Whether you are with Congress or you are against Congress. Because Congress enjoyed that 30-35% plus vote share at pan-India level. The same analogy and same thing applies to BJP. And in that, I also added that any individual who thinks that, you know, it's just a matter of time that BJP will just uh, uh, disappear, they are making a huge mistake. You have, if you are opposed to them, that's a choice which you make. If you are opposed to them, you have to be prepared for a long-term political battle to, uh, to convince people that you present a better proposition than what BJP is offering on the table. It cannot be done in a hurry. It cannot, there is no quick fix to it. There is no <laughs> WhatsApp uh, uh, network that can, that can uh, help you do this overnight. And there is no Prashant Kishore or no individual who can help you uh, correct all these things. You have to be committed for many more years and take the fight on the grassroots, knowing fully well that it could take many years to probably win. Now, Mamata Banerjee uh, defeated the BJP in West Bengal. This was a battle that, you know, in many senses was defining uh, because I think you had mentioned once that if the BJP won it, you would see a different turn in Indian politics. Before we come to that, uh, let us look at what are the lessons uh, the uh, TMC win in West Bengal did. It show, what did it show and how, did, how was the BJP defeated in that? Well, uh, I, the first statement, if BJP were to win Bengal, definitely, I have said it before and I repeat, country would have taken a big leap towards one nation, one party kind of uh, situation. Uh, but as it has not happened... Uh, now, this could be analyzed at length what all led to uh, uh, TMC's defeat. I would say the TMC's victory. TMC's victory. Uh, the largely, BJP stayed with the narrative and strategies that worked for them in 2019 Lok Sabha elections in West Bengal, giving a huge dividend of 18 MP seats. So, they just literally they extended that same strategy and tactics on the ground without necessarily factoring in the changes or the course correction that TMC did or the TMC le leadership did on their side. So whether it was the leadership of Mamta Banerjee, whether uh, her governance uh, setup or the way TMC has organized itself, all went under uh, massive uh, course correction. I don't think BJP in, uh, with all their... Um, skills on wisdom and resources at hand uh, factored the changes that happened and that was the difference. What were the big changes? I mean three or four things that it, uh, Mamta Banerjee did that ensured that she would win. Well her connect with the masses was far more appealing than what it was in 2018 and I leave the interpretation of this line to you people. Her governance she made a very concerted effort to reach out uh, both through her governance uh, uh, machinery as well as the political network to reconnect with people and she was humble enough to understand that there could be valid reasons for which people were upset 
or were not as uh, 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 gung ho about uh, her government uh, as they should and uh, as they could, and she made those corrections. So whether it was a program like Didi Ke Bolo, where 75 lakh people called and registered their point of view, and that was taken into cognizance, or whether it was uh, the massive uh, outreach program that was launched Dwaris Sarkar, which a lot of people literally ignored and I think if you recall I have been talking to you one single game changer was Duare Sarkar 2.8 crore individuals they appeared they, they, they not appeared they came to those camps got their uh, a small little governance related problems solved that made a huge difference of course uh, beyond this thing then there was a Paray Shamadhan where every uh, small hamlet of uh, Bengal was reached out, assessed, and there was an effort made that whatever little problems, whether it was a water logging, whether it's a bus stand or a missing teacher in the school or a hospital, that was proactively addressed. And of course, the political side, all, all what that was done is largely known to public. So broadly, I would you say... You didn't even three. talk of the polarization. What was the counter she was able to do on this? See, I have said this on record, polarization was a factor and uh, the reason BJP has got 38% vote, a bulk of that is because of this religious-based polarization. But polarization has a limit. I've been saying this uh, in some of the uh, interactions I have had of late. Uh, we have looked at data and we have found that polarization has a limit of 50-55%. It is very difficult to polarize any community uh, on religious issues beyond 50-55%. Uh, and that largely has held uh, on in Bengal as well. So if you look at the population uh, 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 in, in Bengal, BJP vote share roughly translates to this 50-55% uh, people voting on the religious grounds. So would you say that Hindutva per se, which the BJP and the RSS is propagating, has its limitations in India because the majority, they might have a certain section that will vote for them and do it, but as a strategy or electoral strategy, it has its limitations? Well, any strategy has its limitations. To that extent, yes, Hindutva, only Hindutva has its own limitations as well because basis Hindutva, you are not going to get 50% vote in India. That's very clear. Hmm. Because the Why do you say that? Because Hindus are not homogeneous, uh, as homogeneous uh, uh, religious community as many would like to believe. Uh, second, there are vast number, I would say it's 50, I will, at India level I'll put it at 50-50, who are not necessarily willing to take Hindutva, many Hind, I'm talking about Hindus, who are willing to go by this argument of Hindutva and vote on the basis of Hindutva only, and hence it is easier said than done. And this is backed by data, we have looked at elections that has happened post most visible polarizing events, and even then BJP was not able to get more than 55% of the Hindu majority votes. We have seen some amount of that polarization already happening in the UP uh, elections. We have seen the statements that are coming out. Do you think BJP will, I mean, is there that thing to continue on that line of uh, hard Hindutva and, uh, you know... See, I, I, BJP is such a successful party. Who am I to advise them what they should do? Uh, see, it, it's a known fact that Hindutva constitutes whether they call it Hindutva or they name it differently, it, this constitutes one of the major factors in their electoral or political strategy. Uh, there is no point in uh, crying about it. You have to account for it and put a counter to it. They will do what they think is working for them. It, but we have demonstrated in Bengal and before that it was done at least uh, in a very high-pitched battle in 2015 in Bihar that it has got its limitation. But this is not to say that it is not a very formidable thing. It's a very formidable lever in their hand, uh, but it is not uh, something which cannot be defeated or countered. How would you see, since UP uh, Uttar Pradesh is going to the polls in February, how would you see the formation there and the fact that you have someone like Yogi Adityanath who's seen as the hardline Hindu? What difference that would make to the voting uh, behavior? Well, I have already said, no matter who is the face, 
and what the events are that are quote unquote seen as polarizing face or polarizing events, uh, it has got its limitations. Having said that, rather than talking about what will happen in UP in terms of electoral outcome, I don't want to get into that guesswork. Uh, what I would like to mention as a substantive point that UP election results are not going to necessarily reflect what is going to happen in 2024 because a lot of people are getting into this trap that whatever happens in UP will set the tone for 2024. Including Amit Shah said in, that. Yes. He might have said this, but I put a counter right. to it and I will give you the data again. Uh, 2012, what, I just want all those who think that the UP election in 2022 is the most important factor, I want them to take a pause and reflect what happened in UP in 2012. In 2012, BJP was number third or number fourth party in uh, UP. UP was swept by SP. But that had got no implication in 2014 elections. So if that was true, what, why are you saying that whatever happens in 2022 will happen in 2024? It suits BJP to say that whatever happens in UP, that means 2024 is done. Because you're pitting Mr. Modi then in that. No, they are in a stronger position in uh, UP. So they probably are, would like to present that if UP is done, give up for 2024. I'm saying that's not true because in 2012, when BJP was not strong in UP and SP was very strong, SP won uh, uh, the Vidhan Sabha election, BSP was number two, BJP's vote share was about 10%, but two years down the line, BJP came and uh, took almost 37, 38% vote in UP and won almost 70 seats. So I'm saying, yes, important as it is, the UP election, please do not please do not get into this narrative that whatever happens in UP in 2022 would determine what will happen in 2020. You're saying it's not a semi-final? No, not at all. Hmm. Not at all. These are very different elections because between, even if you want to see as a state elections as precursors to what will happen in general election, which is actually not true, but suppose for that argument's sake that you take that, you have to realize that between the next round of elections and the final Lok Sabha elections in 2024, there are eight states that will go for poll. And if BJP doesn't do very well in those eight states, people would have by that time would have forgotten what has happened in UP. Now coming uh, back to the West Bengal win, does it in some senses, the strategy, if one put it, you won the majority of the uh, of the minority and minority of the majority. I mean, that was the sort of sum up of the strategy that uh, you had once articulated. Would that work uh, nationally or you need the majority of the majority in the national elections? No, what I'm saying is uh, those who think sometimes that you know, all Hindus have become saffronized, they're making a huge mistake because BJP's vote share at national level is showing that they are not getting more than 50% of Hindu vote. Even if, assume that every vote that BJP gets, they get it because of the saffronization of Hindus, which is actually not true. But assume that every vote that BJP gets, they get it because uh, Hindus are saffronized. That also is telling us that 50% for every Hindu that is willing to vote for BJP, one Hindu is not voting for um, BJP. So if I am a political challenger, I would look at those half of the Hindu population and take, try to galvanize them and bring them on, uh, on my side to put a counter to BJP electorally, what you are calling minority of uh, uh, majority. Uh, yes, so that's the denominator I was talking uh, a, a while ago, that there is enough uh, even if you want to apply that lens, Hindu, Muslim, if there are, there are enough, there is a enough Hindu voters or peop, uh, electorates who are not saffronized, so don't give up on that. There is a scope. If you do your things right, you can take them on board and they will, most likely they are going to be with you. So if, if you take a look at the BJP, for instance, look at its machinery that it's built up. Uh, you know, uh, look at the way they've gone right down to the booth, the Panna Samiti is doing. What is the 
kind of uh, example they're setting for the rest of the opposition, opposition parties. If opposition parties have to defeat this formidable force and its machinery, they have a leader, they have a narrative as well as the machinery, the three vital things that you said are necessary. What would the opposition need to do if they had to start now to win this, uh, to, to at least put a pose a formidable challenge to the BJP. Get the four levers right. You have to have the messenger, the face. You have to have the message, the narrative. You have to have the mechanics, which is you call united opposition or the political parties. And along with the missionary, probably you need to add one more layer of mechanics, which is to have this quick, rapid response to take on BJP, whether, whether it is messaging, whether it is uh, political tactics on the ground. Uh, if you get these four right, you can put a challenge to them. There's no two way about it. Which means you have to start planning when? The fact is... The like yesterday. You should have started yesterday. And what should be your long term? It should be 2024, 20, 2029. What would you say if you were advising a political party to go? See, two years is not a short time. So I wouldn't give up on 2024. Uh, but if you really want to take uh, BJP, somebody has to have a long term approach seven to ten years because you might defeat them with one so one combination that comes together in 2024 uh, but for you to hold on to that ground you need to constantly strengthen these four elements and the four levers or the four buckets whatever you want to call it and where is bjp uh, vincible i mean where where is the vulnerability that you see in the bjp it looks like a huge behemoth it seems very but organized. actually they're not Okay. You see, wherever hmm. they have faced uh, a tough uh, political challenge, hmm. they haven't been able to necessarily steamroll everyone as it appears. They mm -hmm. have been able to steamroll largely Congress mm -hmm. because their strike rate against Congress is now in 95-96%. But their strike rate vis-a-vis -vis other parties are not that great. If you look at the eastern and southern India, starting from Bihar, go down to the Kerala, so you start with Bihar, West Bengal, Orissa, United Andhra, which is Andhra and Telangana, Tamil Nadu and Kerala. This roughly 200 seats, BJP is limited to 54 seats. So they have got 17 seats in uh, Bihar, they have got 18 in West Bengal, they have got 12 in Orissa, 4 to best of my recall in Telangana, no in Tamil Nadu and no in Andhra. So this tells you that almost 40% of Lok Sabha seats BJP has not been able to penetrate as much as they would have liked it, despite not uh, having formidable united opposition. In these areas, individual parties, individual leaders or their setup has been able to withstand the onslaught, if you want to call it, uh, the political onslaught uh, unleashed by BJP in the last 10 years. And, and if you take a look at... Uh... It is the problem lies in the western and the northern side. Yes. But vulnerability lies that if a force emerges in north and west that takes away, say, 100 odd seats from BJP, then this east and south comes into equation and they become quite vulnerable. The problem is in west and north of India, and I'm adding right from Karnataka to Kashmir and uh, uh, from uh, uh, west of Bihar to Gujarat, this is the region where BJP is having literally sweeping everything. But if they were to lose 100 seat to any political leader or formation in this region, that will make them quite vulnerable. Now, Bihar, take Bihar. We saw, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the assembly elections over there. It looked like a surefire win for uh, Nitish Kumar and the uh, BJP. But as it turned out, Tejasvi seemed to have, you know, made them huff and puff to the finishing line. What was the reason that it became such a close fight? Everybody had sort of said... It's, you know, it, it looks like the combination of uh, Nitish and BJP would take the cake. Well, I, Bihar election result need to be analyzed a little bit more carefully mm -hmm. before arriving at this conclusion that it was a very close battle. I'm not trying to take away the credit where it is due, but if you really want to make an objective analysis of what happened in Bihar, you have to see Bihar elections happening in two parts. One part which was fought by BJP vis-a-vis -vis RJD Congress Alliance and one part that was fought by JDU vis-a-vis -vis RJD uh, Congress Alliance. Now, in the 110-15 seat which BJP fought, their strike rate is as high as it ever was. They have won more than 70. Their strike rate, in fact, in Bihar is highest 
even in last election. So it was not as close as uh, you are describing or a lot of people are thinking. What happened is for combination of three to four, because of three to four factors, in the seats where JDU was fighting RJD, the strike rate of Nitish Kumar's party went down dramatically less, uh, lower. And the reasons were seemingly unpopularity of Nitish Kumar per se, Second, the organizational weakness of JDU that is like known to the world. It's not no longer a secret. Third was this Chirag Paswan's factor. Uh, and uh, fourth was BJP's mis lack of coordination between BJP's machinery and uh, the, that of the JDU in those seats. Now, because of these four factors, uh, RJD Alliance did extremely well in the seats where half of Bihar where JDU was fighting. But their strike rate was not as good uh, in remaining 110 seats where BJP was fighting. So yes, it appeared very close at the end. But if you are trying to draw inference from there and make a mistake uh, and say that next election is just a matter of few more additional votes, you'll be making a huge mistake. If you have to win Bihar, you have to defeat BJP, not mm. Nitish Kumar. Mm. That's the bottom line. And what happened in last election is RJD Alliance was able to defeat uh, Nitish Kumar, but then the real fight is with the BJP, not with the Nitish Kumar. And, and what were the big take takeaways that TMC in its victory gave? What are the big take takeaways while dealing with the BJP? Well, you can't be defensive. For You can't be defensive. You cannot start too late. And you can't be complacent. Hmm. You have to accept what did happen with TMC in 2019 Lok Sabha. They were not probably willing to accept that BJP is a formidable electoral force in Bengal. See, there is no problem in accepting the strength of your opposition. So long you know you are determined to defeat and you know how to, then only you know how to defeat it. This whole uh, narrative that by acknowledging the strength of your opposition, you are conceding defeat, I laugh at it. You actually said I, I said it other in, way in, around. In I rather overestimate my challenger or the opponent so that I am prepared accordingly. So one of the fundamental difference was in 2018, Trinamool literally, uh, 2019 Lok Sabha election, they were not taking BJP as seriously as they, they should have taken. Become complacent. They became complacent or you just... Are thinking that anyway, you know, no, who is going to vote for them in, in, in West Bengal? In politics, or for that matter, anything, the war, the exams, as, as our elders have taught us, you can never take things, your opponent, lightly. The biggest mistake you can do is to take your opponent lightly. The, but once you have taken cognizance of their strength, there is always a scope to put a counter, because I can't repeat this enough, the fight is between 40 and 60. The BJP at best can go up to 40. You are still having 60% to operate. But if you think that that 40 is, uh, uh, you do not take cognizance of the 40, then you would be not be preparing to get more than 40% vote on the other side. Now, since we're talking about the BJP, let's move to the NDA and particularly Mr. Modi. Um, Mr. Modi and his government, it has completed seven and a half, uh, you know, is, is close to midterm of its second uh, term as uh, prime minister. How would you assess the Modi government at the moment? Well, that assessment is out there in your survey. Uh, he has been re-elected in 2019. So people have voted. In democracy, end of the day, you have to respect the wisdom of the crowd, wisdom of the people. And if people have found uh, him doing the right things and voted him in, who are you and me to say he is performing well or not? We can debate it all our lives, but what matters is what people are saying and people are saying that by and large uh, they have been happy with what he delivered in first first five years now that might may or may not have met my expectation or your expectation but that's a different thing but that's the majority view and we have to respect that now in the last two and a half years that he's uh, been prime minister for the second term what is your assessment my assessment again i will back on to the surveys that are there uh, in public domain, where including yours is the MOTN survey, which is, I think, is one of the most reliable ones. You, his popularity rating is not dramatically down. It has shown some dip post-COVID too, 
but uh, we have to wait and see whether that trend persists is persisting or uh, it was just one off thing uh, it's quite dramatic the fall but uh, i'm still not getting the sense and i could be wrong uh, that there is a widespread disenchantment with his leadership i'm not getting the sense yes there is an urge for other better alternative but it is not same as having a large section of society disenchanted who are willing to go against him irrespective of other factors in place now, in play that's a good point you're making in the sense that here is um, you know a, a leader who's faced one of the biggest crises that any leader can face you had the covid pandemic you know unprecedented in its uh, this thing a terrible second wave that hit the country and the fact that the economy went into doldrums because of that yet you don't see that uh, you know uh, what you're talking of a kind of dis uh, resentment dissension across the country what is the reason for that no one of the reason is that you have to understand and this is what i again in uh, that museum of goa talk also i was i was explaining to people or trying to explain that you have to realize that some of the usual understanding as it were that just the rise in inflation or the mahangai would make the ruling uh, leader a ruling dispensation hugely unpopular you know you have seen all your life uh, governments have been skeptical in raising even diesel prices by 1 rupee this is the government under whose watch the diesel prices has gone up by 50 rupees but they reduced it recently yeah they have reduced it by a little bit which is right. nothing compared to what they have raised so imagine if you would have been interviewing dr manmohan singh or his most uh, savvy political uh, uh, advisors and have advised them that why don't you raise diesel prices by 20 rupees what would have been the reaction that what are you talking about if we raise 20 rupees diesel prices by 20 rupees government will fall people will be on the street but if that is not happening because prices have gone up and still people are not on the road that should make you and i think that there must be some other factors in play and what unless we recognize what are those factors we will keep thinking that just because diesel prices has gone up he will lose election and after the election result i'll be again will be surprised and that's the point we are trying to make that you need to understand his strengths why those strength reasons behind those strength and then put a counter and what are those strengths well it's multifold but what i see is this hindutva remains the core but they have added two significant things uh, as one is this hyper nationalism which is a new addition to their armory uh, so anything you say criticize attack uh, people they say you are anti anti india so you're not so the hindutva is one that's there in their pocket they have added this additional layer of hyper nationalism and uh, you see anecdotally you would have seen videos of people saying that i am happy paying 50 rupees extra because it is going for the nation building because it is helping the country so you you have to correlate these two to find that this hyper nationalism thing the rast ke liye you know you have to make some sacrifice आपने डिमोनेटाइजेशन में देखा होगा पीपल स्टैंडिंग इन क्यूज एंड फीलिंग हैप्पी अबाउट इट मेनी ऑफ देम एटलीस्ट ऑन कैमरा दैट यू नो वी आर डूइंग इट बिकॉज वी वांट टू बिल्ड न्यू इंडिया और अ स्ट्रॉगर इंडिया सो वी आर अंडर एस्टिमेटिंग दैट लिवर एंड थर्ड इज दिस हाउस होल्ड लेवल डिलीवरी यू कैन नॉट अंडर अंडर एस्टिमेट द इम्पैक्ट ऑफ इट बीट टॉयलेट बीट उज्ज्वला बीट दिस नल का जल नाउ दे हैव स्टार्टेड you know some of these things mundane as it look to you or me or to many analysts here are vital differentiator so i see they have three layer of the strategic support advantage one is this hindutva the ideology and you have to put a counter to that second is this they their this uh, hyper nationalism thing where they have literally been able to brand anyone who is criticizing them as being anti india 
and third is a very focused uh, approach to deliver benefits uh, even if it is very small in nature and quantum at the household level unless out of these three you break one and you take away one or two uh, it's very difficult to defeat them at the national level what happens in Bidhan Sabha election that this hyper nationalism thing doesn't work that much there is a reason why BJP's vote share goes down in uh, uh, in Bidhan Sabhas and if you analyze it carefully you would realize that maybe this hyper nationalism for country with country that thing goes down and at many places we also counter it with sub regionalism that you know Bengal should be led by Bengali or Bihar should be run by a Bihari that kind so there is a counter when you are doing a Bidhan Sabha but when you go in the Lok Sabha this becomes a very very formidable thing to counter and we need to think or we or anyone who wants to take them on need to think how to deal with it like I was telling you about Hindutva that there is a limit of 50% so you have to reach the another 50% of Hindus not by ad adopt being a soft Hindu Hindutva as they are uh, claiming but being more strategic and uh, uh, and effective in reaching out to the remaining 50 similarly this hyper nationalism you have to have a counter and household delivery you have to have a better governance uh, model or offering unless you hit on all these three uh, merely sitting and hoping that uh, this thing has gone wrong why demon after demonetization people are still voting for him why after covid still people are voting for him that would not work to buy to the best of my understanding. So the Prime Minister, Mr. Narendra Modi, in some sense has been smart and, or clever or wise or actually wanted to do these things. That welfareism, as we see it. Welfareism mixed with hyper-nationalism and, and Hindu Hindutva. Hindutva. It's a very potent weapon. So he's actually, uh, in some senses, appropriated the plank that the left of center parties had, which was welfareism and we would you know, serve the poor and everything else. That, I think, has sort of dented the opposition. In no, some I'm saying this cocktail of these three, right. the welfareism at household level rather right. than community. So if you look at his welfareism, the way I understand, it's more focused at household and individual. The individual cash transfers, uh, community, uh, and rather than focusing uh, on getting the votes on basis the roads and the general development, etc., etc., ki school kitne ban rahe, hospital kitne ban rahe, that, those things are there, but his primary focus is Jandhan account, Ujwala, how many people, the beneficiaries, how many people have actually got the account, how many people have got those cylinders, how many people have got the toilets, how many people are getting this cash transfer in Kisan uh, Nidhi and all. So that with, together with this hyper-nationalism and Hindutva, this is the combination which, which makes it quite formidable for you to break in. It's not impenetrable, you can. But I'm saying you have to take cognizance that this is what makes his fort very strong. And where is his vulnerability? Is? Where is no, the... vulnerability lies on all three. All three. All you, three. There's nothing outside these three factors that you could uh, no, attack. No, of course there are other factors if you are smart enough to mm, come out with something new. Uh, you know, people making an attempt, uh, uh, whether it's on this caste-based census and all. You know, there could be an issue. You can make a sound. There are other issues on which you can, but you cannot, to the best of my understanding, you cannot defeat him at India level until and unless you are able to dent him in all these three. That on welfareism, you have a better proposition than what he is offering. On hyper nationalism, you have a narrative and uh, credibility which is better than what he is presenting to the country. And on uh, Hindutva, uh, the even though the radicals or the fundamentalists are with him, the liberals are with you. If you do this, then only you can have your own challenge to him. You mentioned caste as one of the factors. How prominent does caste-based politics continue to play in the decision-making of a voter or across the polity? Caste is very important. And for any, for any political party or a leader, understanding of caste is very important more than actually the but understanding of caste and caste politics is not same as doing the caste politics some of the smartest politicians i have met who understand caste and caste dynamics actually they don't do caste politics but they under, their understanding of caste is very very good uh, now how much caste plays into voting preference is a matter of debate in my understanding caste plays only in the absence of a 
popular face or a popular narrative or an event what you guys call lahar wave election so say for example 1984 there was an event in form of death of late indra ji then the caste barriers broke in case of say narendra modi the face it captured the imagination of all of india the caste barrier broke if there is a narrative like in it happened in case of bp singh raja nahi fakir hai desh ki takdeer hai like he is a anti corruption crusader etc etc then caste barrier broke when why do i say caste barrier broke because you see the some of the states that quote unquote seen as base, voting only on the basis of caste they voted for narendra modi the in 2014 narendra modi's caste people are not there in bihar or up in 1984 the same population voted for congress they were not all voting because uh, congress all of sudden has found a new caste alignment so yes but in absence of a popular face or a narrative or uh, an event people tend to fall back on their identities ki chalo kuch nahi hai to apne jati wale ko de dete hain but if there is any one of these three it is quite possible to transcend the caste boundaries and this is not my assessment this is what data tells us from last 40 50 years because caste proportion among the electorate is the same largely remains same with minor fluctuation over 10 years 15 20 years if in a community you have 12% yadav they are not going to become 24% next next election but the results change the same block can vote the same block can who has been voting uh, on the basis of caste could vote completely differently if there is a face that galvanizes them or they captures their imagination or if there is a narrative which kind of binds them all together or there is an event that is emotional enough for them to uh, get over their identity now there uh, in terms of performance of government we have seen a many chief ministers being re-elected as chief minister we start with mr modi we seen it with uh, uh, ms Ma- Ma- mamata banerji we are seeing it uh, we saw it in madhya pradesh where you you know uh, and uh, chatisgarh where people have had long stints uh, running uh, governments is that some indication what does that say are now people maturing or the uh, the voters are maturing to say unless i get something from there i see a, a good government i will what otherwise well it's a very difficult question to uh, answer Uh, what makes some governments continue and what right uh, doesn't one of my of late i have been thinking about it myself you know one of the things which i realize is the governments that after re- assuming the power invest in the organization pa- political organization are more likely to get reelected and why i'm saying so look at whether it is navin babu Uh, uh, BJD yeah, in Navin Odisha. Is a good whether example. you look at KCR, whether you look at uh, uh, Mamata Banerjee, or all BJP governments, even if all go- governmental metrics, even if their performance is same, they are the one who, after getting elected, they have invested in building the party infrastructure. So, Telangana TRS party structure is quite formidable after he became the chief minister. Compared to a typical Congress government. where after they become they assume the government they tend to ignore organization or at least if not ignore they put it on the back foot back seat so if you are coming in the government you must not ignore building of your political organization or operators as you would mm. like to call mm. so that's one that could be one of the critical differentiator so the congress's government reelectability if you put it plot it on the graph is almost one third or less vis-a-vis bjp governments once bjp government comes in power they continue to reelect themselves whether it's madhya pradesh gujarat barring one or two exam uh, 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 exception say rajasthan they have flipped uh, twice in kerala in karnataka they have flipped in both cases you would see the organizational operators of bjp is not as formidable or has the leadership of bjp at that time who assumed power was not probably as invested in building the organization as it was the case in gujarat or madhya pradesh 
or in the case it's not only unique to BJP as in the case of say a BJD or TRS, the stronger regional parties. And corruption, which is again one of the major factors we've no, seen. I'm saying, I'm, I'm saying assuming the government, fair, uh, all fair. things equal on the governance. Sure. Because none of these guys are necessarily providing you a transformational government. There could be an incremental positive or incremental negative. But some governments are getting re-elected five times and some governments are not getting elected twice or thrice. I think this could be one of the reasons, but I don't have the full answer to it. And, and how important is corruption, the anti-corruption move? Or does the electorate look at it that way? Because we saw the anti-corruption movement happen in, in 2012, 2013. And then Mr. Uh, Narendra Modi's government say, you know, uh, uh, projects itself as a clean government. We haven't had the kind of, kind of scams that happened during the U UPA regime. What is the sense in terms of uh, voting patterns when it comes to... Are, are electorate really concerned about corruption? Uh, see... Being concerned about one thing, whether it influences the voting preference is a different thing. Yes, you go and talk to anybody and you look at survey of last 50, 60 years. Corruption, comes. corruption will come in top three. Right. Corruption, Mangai, Bikas will Correct. be always top three. And still you see the voting preferences very different than what you find in survey. It's because I think corruption becomes an electoral or a voting, uh, an issue that affects voting preference when your political operators uh, is seen as moved from being intermediaries to interface sorry interface to intermediary mm -hmm. so you know any political party which comes in government they have this large political operators that works right helps them get elected in that process they are the interface between the leader and the party and the government and people over a period of time if corruption comes at that level making them intermediaries so we have seen what has happened in West Bengal left government or we have seen what has happened in uh, TDP uh, uh, Andhra and in many other. When this interface, the, the lower ranking uh, uh, rank and file of your party becomes the intermediary where they start extracting money from the people for the benefits which otherwise should have reached them any which way, that probably affects you electorally. In terms of perception, yes, running a clean government is always an advantage, if that is the perception. But people are wise enough to understand that no one is 100% clean. And, uh, but so long it doesn't affect their day-to-day -day life, I, in my limited understanding, would like to believe that it doesn't affect your voting preference to that extent. However, the reverse is true. If at a higher level, you might be clean as you are, but your intermediary is, are becoming uh, too corrupt, where people have to pay what we call pity corruption uh, for to get their benefits, to get their rasan, to get their caste certificate, to get their uh, uh, scholarships, that hits you more badly than other corruption. But we saw in UPA government where you know, a large number of scams sort of seemed to have uns uh, unseated them. What is that, that would have contributed in the larger narrative. Hmm. But you don't see it as the deciding No, part. I don't think uh, they, they lost, the go lost the election only because of this thing. Yes, of course, it, would have, it created a huge perceptional uh, challenge for them. But uh, again, I'm telling you, in India, you go and you survey. I don't think we will find many people uh, finding Manmohan Singh, uh, calling Manmohan Singh Ji as corrupt leader. So why did they, they lose? No, they lose for very other, many other reasons. But I'm saying if uh, the leader being corrupt or honest is the criteria, then Marmon Singh go government should have never lost. And I, we see this in many governments. It's the pity corruption down below that affects day-to-day -day life that is electorally that matters more. In terms of perception, yes, leader at the top matters. But in terms of its electoral impact, the pity corruption is far more important than this large perceptional... But since we are on the UPA, what is your analysis of the reasons why the UPA lost? What were the... Oh, God. <laughs> I'd rather not get into it. I'd but rather not get two into Two or three it. major... I, I think uh, post-2000, somewhere in the midway uh, of second regime, they just uh, appeared to have given up on everything, be it governance or a political challenge. Or I don't know whether they gave up because... They 
were not motivated enough to fight or they were, became very complacent. They didn't think that uh, BJP uh, having done very badly in 2009 has the ability to resurrect themselves in a manner in which they did in 2014. I don't know or maybe combination of both. Hmm. Okay, I won't push you on that. I know you've done a lot of analysis. But coming to Mr. Uh, the Prime Minister Narendra Modi, how would you, you've advised him in the early days before he became, what is your sense of uh, his USPs? What makes him what he is? No, I, I said this in many of my, because this is the first question that people ask me, what is his strength? I think he has many strengths. Obviously, it's like, it's given. Anyone who has become the Prime Minister and at this level uh, of, a country like India has to have many strengths. Uh, what to my mind makes, uh, if I have to pick once uh, uh, or two, it would be first the unique experience mix he brings on the table. Uh, so if you look at his last 50 years, the journey, 15 years as a RSS Pracharak, he probably had the best opportunity to understand, interact, engage with the masses uh, in a social setting. Uh, then another 15 years as a political organizer when he was in BJP handling organizational issues, he had the experience of managing, putting together, preparing the political setup uh, the way it should be done. And then 15 years of as the chief minister and now the prime minister. Now, if you put this 45 year of experience mix, it literally is unique in India. Mm. As, a, as I can, I look around, I don't find any other individual. Uh, there might be some, I don't know, but n not that comes to my mind prominently, who has this kind of experience mix in terms of understanding of society at right at the grassroots level firsthand. Uh, running the political organization and running the government. What it does is it makes him literally second guess what people want. Either in his speech or uh, schemes or government response. This is you know, a lot of people tell that he can literally second guess. But that's the symptom. The real issue, he is able to second guess because of this unique professional experience he has 40-45 years. Plus add to this, he's like, very patient listener. Hmm. So for all what you see on the hmm. television, he's a great listener. He has uh, this ability to listen to as many pe people as possibly could be heard on any issues. And that probably gives him the advantage to benefit from all points of views. He can still make a mistake and he has made many mistakes. But I'm saying that I would rate as one of his advantages. And what about the qualities, decisiveness, you know, his ability to take the hard... Well, so decisiveness is, could, be, could cut both ways. Hmm. If you are very decisive, you can make irrational decisions as well. Right. Uh, so I do not necessarily see uh, uh, a decisive leader as, uh, as the good leader. That, to my mind at least... What are the, the qualities of a good leader since we're talking about... No, I'm, I'm, I'm not getting right. into that description but I'm saying uh, I wouldn't put uh, he, uh, d him being seen as decisive above him being a patient listener and the professional e experience mix which he has. I would put still put those two above him being decisive. No, well, since you've seen so many political leaders, what are the key qualities you notice in these leaders that really are successful? What, what are the four or five things that you would say make a good leader? <sighs> Well, you have to be intelligent or wise, goes without saying. Uh, you have to have some character. Hmm. And the third is you have to have courage. Hmm. Now, since you have asked, let me elaborate, uh, el el elaborate on it. You can be less intelligent or less wise, but you can, in that case, if, if you are surrounded by intelligent advisors, you can cover up for lack of intelligence if there is any. Character is a relative term in politics. So I have a bad character, but if my opponent has got very bad, then all of a sudden I look better. What you cannot do without is the courage. That 
there is no substitute to having the courage to be out there judged, commented, criticized, adored. So if I have to put one single thing, it's in common. Of course, you need all these three, but within that three also, courage makes the unique thing which you need to be a leader. And the mantra too, you, you seem to be highly successful in terms of advising people I, you know, how to get electoral success. What is the mantra you use? What is the mantra for success? I, I, first of all, we are highly overrated. And I can't say, you know, I, the, the, the good and the bad thing about us is that either people, first people high, rate us, they overrate us, and then they criticize that I'm taking the claim. I'm trying to take claim of victories of others. So I start by saying that, and I've said this in every interview, and I repeat I repeat that we are highly overrated. You cannot make anyone win or lose, no matter how smart you are. You Parties or leaders, they win or lose basis their own performance, their track record, what they do, they, what they offer and what people see in them. People like us on the margin can help you organize yourself and your outfit a little better than what it would be otherwise. So with that caveat, our job is to listen to what people are saying if you if you really uh, narrow it down my job is to listen to as many voices as i could and make a coherent narrative around it and let the leader accept that as his or her narrative or priority whether you are in opposition or in government basically you are listening to what people are telling it is so difficult for people who are ruling or who are at top to actually hear what is the real chatter on the ground. You know, in we have grown up with uh, this uh, mm, phrase or kahawat ki raja bhes badalkar nikle to unhe pata chala. Why this, this sums up the wisdom of centuries that for a king or a wannabe king the toughest thing is to know what is what people are talking on the ground. No matter how smart you are, no matter how proactive you are in trying to get the feedback from the ground, once you are at that position, it is very difficult for you to know the real chatter on the ground. And that's why the bhes badal ke raja bhi jab bhes badal kar niklenge, tabhi sahi mein log batayenge ki unke vishay mein kya sochte hai ya unke kare kalapo ke vishay mein log kya sochte hai. So our job is primarily to do that. That you are the proxy listener to the people who you are advising to hear every possible voice and they then make a coherent narrative making use of that. A lot of people when we go they say oh this is a new state. What do you know of Bengal? What do you know of Tamil Nadu? Uh, you might have been successful in Bihar but what can you do in Andhra? They make a fundamental mistake. My job is not to understand Bengal or Andhra or Tamil Nadu. My job is to interact with people who know Andhra, who know Tamil Nadu or who know Bengal and make use of their knowledge, their understanding to craft something that works for the leader of the party. So we never try, I personally never try to uh, present or uh, in my own mind also uh, think that let me understand Bengal. I cannot, no matter how smart I am. Somebody who has spent his or her life in Bengal, I cannot outsmart uh, that person in terms of sheer knowledge about Bengal. But what I can do is to listen to many of them and then make a sense of what they are saying. I mean, coming to... So I am, we are yeah. just glorified, articulate listeners who are able to make sense of what we listen in a coherent strategies. Well, you're being humble. <laughs> no, I'm telling this is what it takes. But uh, uh, just before we come to something personal that I want to ask you, in terms of uh, the farmers' agitation, why do you think Mr. Modi, the Prime Minister, decided to repeal the three, uh, this thing? And what is the impact of that? Well, it's only he can answer why he... he, he... What is your sense? Again, I have a very different take on this. This tells us the character of Mr. Modi uh, and how he deals with the political issues. While he is very firm 
uh, when it comes to dealing with individuals or the parties, when it comes to dealing with when he is up against public, he is quite flexible. And look at his three U-turns or a, you know, when, where he has taken, he has been uh, humble enough, if I can give, if we want to give him credit, to take a back step are the issues on which his government was against people. At the same time, he has been careful <laughs> to make sure that nobody else is taking the credit on the other side. So farm uh, land acquisition bill, after bringing three ordinances, he backtracked. But no one could take advantage of it because it was not the opposition was not led by a party or an individual leader. So was the case in CA and RC, and so is the case in farm law things. So while yes, there will be a perceptional temporary, I underline the word, temporary perceptional setback, what he has done is he has neutralized the something that could have become bigger in terms of negative thing for him. At the same time, he knows that there is no substantial tangible benefit, political benefit to any individual or a party because they, no political party or leader was actually leading. It was diffused leadership. So when he is up against diffused leadership on the public issue, he is quite flexible and at least he has shown flexibility when he's up against a Congress or a leader or a political formation, he's quite stubborn to that extent. He will never backtrack. So this shows how he operates probably on the political. You think the farm law issue could have been bigger, become bigger and bigger if he hadn't pulled back? Uh, after Lakhimpur uh, uh, incident, it was, to my mind, it was uh, less of about the farm law per se. It was more about is this government being so arrogant? farmers that one sentiment could have uh, uh, gone on to damage if would have remained the way it was so, so electorally or you think i would i would say to that extent lakhimpur incident would have played a very this is my guess yeah and, and, and uh, you know his withdrawing that what what do you think was the reason when he saw of course public resistance but what was the no, main no i'm saying this lakhimpur incident Fine, with that's... his vast experience he knows right that the form law, as it was seen by many, that was limited to two, three estates. While there could be sympathy for the farmers across India, the real agitation was in Haryana, Punjab and parts of Uttar Pradesh. But what happened in Lakhimpur uh, probably uh, gave the opportunity uh, for those who are opposed to, were opposed to the law to take this narrative pan-India that this government is anti-farmer or they are so arrogant that they can do anything and that could have probably played a very significant part in his decision. And if you compare leaders since you have looked at a lot of leaders, where would you place Mr. Modi in the pantheon of leaders? It is like above my pay scale. Don't, <laughs> don't ask me to. Uh, uh, I am nobody to rank. Uh, would you, would you uh, compare him with any previous leader? Where does he stand in that? I, I will let it pass at this stage. Okay. I usually don't uh, let questions uh, pass, but let's not take take Ms. Mamata Banerjee. Do you think, uh, in terms of being a prime minister, she's there? She can be that. Where do you assess her, and what is her unique qualities? See, again, we make this mistake of trying to judge individual and pass a verdict. Uh, we have to be humble enough to give it to, leave it to the people that who they think qualifies for the job. A lot of people made, made this mistake about Mr. Modi, if you remember, calling him X, Y or Z. But their wisdom, they might appear more articulate, they might have come with a very fancy degree and uh, professional experience, it counts nothing in, in front of the wisdom of the people. So. To many people, commentators, they might find flaws or negatives in what Mamta Banerjee brings, or for that matter, any other leader. You have to leave it to the people. The fact is, he has been successful chief minister for now this is the third term. Before that, he has been 
hugely successful in terms of being MP multiple times uh, makes her a good contender but it is for the people to judge and it is for them to decide whether she fits the bill or not her ability in her unique ability to my mind would be as we were discussing about Mr. Modi in case of her would be her ability to connect with the masses probably puts her uh, is her biggest strength uh, you know she's one of you plus she is a female right so you know plus she has seems to have a lot of courage to yes so courage of course courage I, I, I said but I'm saying her ability to connect with masses she has this natural uh, ability to connect with her masses many a times despite having uh, some constraint with the language but she still can charm you with her own way and that's a very big advantage to have uh, uh, as a political leader. What about being a pan-India face? Because to be a prime minister, you need to appeal to vast cross-sections. No, of the but people. anyone, see, when, when you start, you are not born as pan-India. You are born somewhere in India. You start your journey somewhere in India. So that way, Mr. Guj Mr. Modi was a Gujarat leader. Or for that matter, others leader as well. Mr. Dev Gowda or Narsimha Rao or... Uh, all other leaders they or they started from somewhere it's a more than where you origin originate is how you evolve as it is she is the leader of bengal as it is probably she captures the imagination of many across india who see in her the potential fighter or somebody who can take on the ruling dispensation but Still, she has to evolve uh, in a manner which is acceptable to the vast majority of India if she has to become a challenger. And I put a lot of ifs. So, <laughs> and, and finally, it's, some yes. Yes, personal questions. You, what is, you know, you joined a political party, you gave that up, you formed your own. What was your relationship with Nitesh and why did you pull out from uh, the JDU and what's the... So, I have been on record on this. Uh, I said very warm relation with Nitish Kumar and I must tell this, I have said this on record and I repeat, I'm repeating. For the time when we have been together, my relationship with Nitish Kumar was that of a father and son. He has treated me that well and I've also seen him that in that light only. We separated because he is with BJP and uh, we realized that it is not possible for me to be with him uh, while he continues to be with BJP. So we separated. There is no acrimony as such on any issues. Uh, he has his own compulsions. I would like to believe that. That at, It's also a function of age and what you want to do or what you are able to do. His priorities as he states publicly and otherwise also that I want to do the job in Bihar. And for him to continue ruling Bihar or being the chief minister of Bihar, it is imperative right now that he has he remains with BJP I'm not comfortable with that idea so only way he and I would have continued is if he would have agreed to walk out and we would have tried to win Bihar on our own or in different combination that didn't happen plus CAA was the trigger and, and that debate was going on between him and me almost like immediately after I joined and uh, in his wisdom, he tilted towards maintaining the status quo, which I respect. It is his party. It is he who got me there. But if he decided that no, he doesn't want to uh, kind of rattle the uh, existing formation, I was at my liberty to walk out of it and look for my own trajectory and my own journey. And with the, you also advised the, Mr. Modi and the BJP. Why did you, why didn't you continue that? Was there problems? No, with but it? we, uh, that I have answered long back. We, I uh, separated from them in 2014 itself, when I went and uh, did a, a start working with Nitish Kumar in 2015. There was a reason, and uh, that reason is between me and the Prime Minister. Whatever might be the reason, uh, and all what has been reported in public you know, saying that I have a personal issues with Mr. Amit Shah and all, it's completely false. Uh, he was not in picture and I must 
clarify this once for all if it helps anyone that no it, it was a decision between me and the Prime Minister and uh, I don't find fault with him either it was not his job to look after what I want to do our journey was together till that time we were to work together and then it's my own destiny and what I choose to do for myself and he is doing what he is supposed to be doing there, you know there is no quarrel on that but a lot of people will say that means I am his mole or some people will say that my life is driven by idea to defeat them both are incorrect I am I my life is not driven by with this idea that I have to defeat XYZ and equally true is the fact that I and he do not I'm not a mole of anybody I'm too much of a rebel to be mole of anybody uh, but again people cast as persons and uh, I have to be blamed I, I, I don't feel the need to explain this in greater detail I do what I do and I believe that let my work speak if I'm mole of BJP then I don't know what kind of strategy BJP is following to allowing me to help uh, Didi to defeat them in Bengal this is like nonsensical argument but people continue to make that argument that I am the mole of BJP in working with others so I am mole of BJP helping other parties defeat BJP what kind of mole you, you uh, Mr. Modi has created <laughs> this is yeah, unimaginable yeah. Well, what is your personal ambition? Is it to, to, be, to join a political party, to become a leader? What is, where does it my, stand? My personal ambition is to be in politics. I, will, I, am, I see myself, I am in politics almost, in, not in a traditional uh, way, but I, I live, drink, sleep politics more than probably politicians do. Uh, and uh, ultimately be able to do something for my state in Bihar. That's the medium term goal I would say I'm not uh, I'm not wise enough to see what will happen 10 years down the line or 20 years down the line but the fact and one of the debates with Nitish was this that despite what he has done uh, definitely has done some good work in last 10-15 years Bihar continues to be one of the most impoverished poor underdeveloped states take any ranking any uh, assessment and it's time that Bihar should be relooked uh, with a fresh eyes and fresh strategy to see 10 years down the line, 15 years down the line, where does the state reach? If after 15 years of Nitish Kumar's government, 50% people are still below poverty line, uh, I think this requires a change. So my uh, goal, if there is any, if my ambition, if there is any related to this, is to see how situation could be changed in Bihar in a tangible, measurable terms. And if it means joining politics full time? And yes, become... so be it. Whatever it takes. Whatever okay. it takes uh, in the interest of what could be done in Bihar, if it means I have to again align myself to a political party, I'm quite open to it. I am also uh, have said it publicly that when I joined as a politician, I realized the shortcomings I have and so much more I need to learn and I'm very open to this thought that I need to get better I need to learn and I'll make one more attempt I might fail again there's no harm but we are not born with the right to be the leader or something we we we, we are we we are here basis what we know and what we are able to do not because my father has helped me here or I belong to a dynasty or of anything so I do not find problem in me failing I can fail many times I'm not giving up I have made an attempt with Nitish Kumar when I actually joined his party and I failed and I have no qualms about accepting that I I, and, I and failed. you also started your own party no I never did, started I never didn't. started any party I'm temperamentally I'm very opposed to the idea of starting a party unless you have a very unique value proposition to offer starting a political party is the easiest thing to do right especially for someone like me I can start party any day but what what do I offer as a value proposition if I do not have that then just starting a party doesn't serve any purpose so yeah so ambitions are limited political ambitions or the plans are limited to Bihar 
And just a final question, which is, you've seen so many leaders, right, uh, right across the political spectrum. Who would you say that, look, that was someone I really was, in, you know, changed you and why? I mean, which of the leaders that you've dealt with you felt, yeah, look, this is someone I would look up to and... You know. Every everyone changes, not only the leaders. You know, one of the greatest learning my I got from my father. Everything I am is because of my parents. But my father used to tell me that when you meet a person, always look at what is positive in him. What has made the person who he he or she is. So I have this approach of when I meet a person, I'm ex I'm looking at only positives, and when I'm looking at a situation, I'm extremely critical. So this combination works for me. Any situation, I'm always being critical. Any individual I'm meeting, I'm always looking at the positives. So every leader I have worked with, they have contributed to my understanding, my uh, uh, assessment, my way of working. It is there. They have been kind enough to give the opportunity for me to work with them. To say one versus other, everyone is, is unique. I would have learned a great deal, many things from Mr. Modi, so as from Mr. Nitish Kumar, so as with Jagan, so as with Mr. Amrinder Singh or Didi. You, you learn every day. And Punjab, you, you were advising Amrinder for a while, but you, Amrinder Singh for a while, but you Captain Saab and then you... No, I never advised okay. him in this. I, I worked with him in 2017. Okay. He did offer this proposition to become his advisor. When I was in Bengal, in March, he also announced that I have become his advisor. But I went there one day. I realized that, you know, now that I have post-Bengal, I have made a public commitment that I am quitting. There is no way I could have committed. And I, am, I in my resignation also, I have written this, that I am still contemplating my in my own head about my own journey ahead, what I want to do, who I want to work with, where I want to be. And hence, it is not proper for me to continue with this responsibility. And so I resigned. Well, Prashant Gishore, thank you so much. You've taken a lot of time. Thank you. You've explained a lot of things candidly. And uh, we wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.